Gregory Ledbetter, who is our expert from MOOP, which is Marijuana Oversight uh, Committee. Offenses. It was a committee that was created by Access of Love from the lowest priority law. And what we did for two years is kind of go to battle um, with uh, the powers that be to get actual community members seated with oversight, people that actually have experience, not just policy heads, but people that actually have experience with marijuana arrests in a regular basis. Greg is the patient advocate from Black and Brown Just Policy on uh, MOOC. And we have Derek St. Pierre, who is here with us as a criminal defense attorney. And as a criminal defense attorney, he was able to bring Access to Love Collective seven pounds of medicine back, the largest in San Francisco history. So definitely a person that, uh, and he is uh, seated on the Medical Cannabis Task Force's legal committee. And right beside him is our dear friend Dean Holder, who is also on the um, legal committee of the task force and is also Access of Love's permit advisory attorney. Great uh, Black and Brown Just Policy, uh, Marijuana Oversight of Fifth Committee. Uh, but I want to relate to you guys uh, a, little, a few statistics. And believe me, being on the uh, Marijuana Oversight Defense Committee and uh, <coughs> listening to what Jay said, I want to echo the, the sentiment of uh, Jay. Uh, our job is to get the statistics and find out exactly how many people are actually getting arrested for marijuana offenses here in San Francisco. And we try to get all the statistics for California. And um, just in San Francisco, we find that to be a very difficult task. Uh, the information is slow and uh, not coming. So uh, MOOC was pretty much created to be a, a complaint department for those that are uh, coming in contact with uh, police and have bad marijuana um, experiences, I call them bad marijuana experiences, with uh, law enforcement and uh, they feel that they have not been treated properly as medical cannabis patients, then it's up to us to find out exactly why. Uh, there are several police officers that are not cannabis friendly and there are several that are not actually uh, cannabis educate. Some police officers that are just plain not cannabis friendly and then there are some police officers that are just not cannabis educated. Uh, either way it go, uh, people of color, especially in San Francisco, are uh, among the highest people that are arrested and incarcerated because of cannabis arrest. I have uh, some statistics that we were able to get together from 2003, and in California alone, uh, uh, 60,111 people were arrested on marijuana offenses. Now, out of that, 12,132 uh, people were arrested for, uh, for sales. That's 12,132 out of 60,000 people that were arrested for sales. All the rest of them were arrested for other offenses, minor offenses that, that were uh, marijuana uh, related. Now we're talking uh, in California. I'm not sure what goes up and down the states, but uh, every every state varies as to how uh, uh, stringent their marijuana laws are. So uh, the the uh, capital that brings it down to uh, 34.52 per every thousand people. Okay, that don't sound much, but like I said, let's go back to square one. 60,000 people? 60,000 people got arrested for this half of marijuana. That's, that's kind of crazy, okay? Uh, now, the people that, are, that have the highest count rate, you would figure, well, you know, it wouldn't be many states here in California. But uh, Alpine was the number one state, believe it or not. They had 29,952.27. Uh, 
Uh, Sierra, the Sierra Mountains, they only yeah. have 759. Humboldt County, which is a little bit better, you know, they only had 442 uh, arrests. Uh, uh, Plumas, 440, and Trinity County, 437 arrests. Okay, uh, now the lowest arrest rate, you will figure that it might be San Francisco, wouldn't you? No. No. Uh, not even. Uh, uh, San Bernardino County. <laughs> what? Yes, San Bernardino, San Bernardino County had 96 people get arrested in a whole year. Because they okay? killed the rest of them. And that's the most Yeah, yeah. Trailers. Yeah, then it was Tulare County with 105.98% uh, uh, people got arrested. Do you know where we somewhat almost get put in there San Mateo County and they had 105 arrests out there okay now out of all of that um, I'm, I'm just reading off my notes you guys excuse me if I go back and forth um, out of all of that 134 people was of non-color out of all of those arrests, only a hundred. Going back to square one, 60,000, y'all. <laughs> and 134. 134 people were uh, of, uh, I guess we'd say, European persuasion. Uh, and if you're not from Europe, if you're not from Europe, then you're a person of color, just in case you guys didn't know that. All right? Uh, 391 people of color were arrested in the year 2002. That, that's just in, in all in all. Um, but that's the ratio. I mean, like I said, it didn't sound like much to begin with. I mean, you know, 391, that's pretty good in a year. But that's the ratio of five to one, all right? For every one person that is not of color, they're taking five people to jail. That means you, 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 he and you. All of you come with me. We're going to the jailhouse for just having for carrying medicine. Uh, that's a bit strange. What was Spe San Francisco's number? What was the number? Uh, actually, San Francisco's, like I said, we've been having such problems these days getting statistics from uh, uh, SFPD and, and the only person that I could truthfully say that's been pretty well um, cooperative and forthcoming has been the health department. And of course, the health department would be, they have nothing invested in this war that we call the drug war. Okay? But, um, let me see. Uh, oh, I didn't get a chance to tell you guys, too. All of that, all through that whole year, and that was just uh, 2002, it cost them a billion dollars to enforce those medical cannabis laws. A billion dollars. That was in 2002. We're in 2011 now. Do you know how much they're probably spending now on those fancy little cars that's breaking doors down and, and raiding gardens and things like that? It has to be in the hundreds of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, I do have one, I want to turn around it before I close to tell you guys, in, in uh, 2007, even the DEA's administrative law judge, Francis Young, concluded uh, in strict medical terms, marijuana is safer than many foods we, we consume. All right? Uh, you think I'm kidding? You think I'm kidding? It no. how, look, did you know if you ate ten raw potatoes mm -hmm. that it would have it would be such a t uh, so much toxicity in your body that it would uh, almost kill you? It might even kill you. Sorry. All right, that's potatoes. So, uh, How about potatoes? Yeah. Uh, he also goes on to say that it is, uh, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Uh, of course, now I'm sure you guys know that you cannot die 
from cannabis. So, cannabis in its raw or in its regular state of mind, even put in to baked goods or in concentrates, have never, ever killed anybody. And that's also uh, by Judge, uh, Assistant Law Judge Francis Young. Okay, he's not a, uh, look, his mouth ain't no prayer book, but you know, I kind of like some of the things he's saying here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> some of the things that you don't necessarily hear all the time, neither. So, um, in closing, Next oh, oh, actually, uh, the next meeting to MOOC, I uh, have not gotten a chance to get with my board, my colleagues, to find out exactly when the room is scheduled. But I do know that uh, after extension ways, uh, extenuous uh, uh, deliberation back and forth and tireless efforts, we have finished a end of the year report on getting out and doing some outreach to you folks because you are my family, you are the people of color, and you are the people that I'm in office to try to help out because this SFPD, what did you say before to say? They lie. They lie. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm not a driving force. I'm just a fourth force to bring forth to you guys the statistics and empower you guys with the knowledge of what we can do as a person of color to defeat this uh, unbalance of justice. All right. We Uh, guest speakers. So what we passed out is something that patients that worked on the oversight committee, which is predominantly access to love patients, came together and created a questionnaire for people who have had a law enforcement encounter that was in regards to uh, cannabis. So please look through and be familiar with this. And you can fill this out as a witness. They've been having problems having people actually give statistics because everybody's still afraid to fill out a questionnaire about a police encounter. And you don't have to do it with your name on it, but we need those statistics. And I wanted to just bring a few points in where lowest priority does not cover you. So lowest priority means that the, 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 the police department is supposed to have cannabis as the absolute lowest priority. If you're not covered, here are some situations where marijuana offenses are not considered, not considered lowest law enforcement. Anyone 18 involved under 18 involved with a marijuana offense. Giving or selling of marijuana to minors under 18. Giving or selling marijuana to adults on public property, including streets, sidewalks, parks, buildings, or other public property. I'm not gonna take a question. Um, giving or selling marijuana to adults in view of people on public property, unless this takes place entirely inside one's home or inside a private building driving while under the influence of marijuana. Any acts of violence or threats that are related to take place along with the marijuana offense. <clears throat> when police or sheriffs believe the marijuana offense can cause serious physical harm to the public. So in other words, are you in jeopardy and are people who are homeless more in jeopardy and a target of arrest? Yes. 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 We worked with the Board of Soups, with the working group that created this legislation I was a part of. I was the only poor person that was a part of creating this legislation and I fought tirelessly to try to inform my colleagues that most of this targets people that don't have homes. And they didn't want to look at that. What they wanted to make sure of is that their larger grows were protected from police encounters, which Yes, we want to make sure that they're protected, but yeah. when are we going to change some of these laws so that the folks that are most vulnerable, like our people, 21,000 U.S. veterans are roaming around the city who are more on target 
for cannabis arrest than any co any collective owner, any grower that you know that can afford to have four lights in their house. That homeless veteran is more on target than any of us, and that's something we need to think about when we want to change these laws again. I also want to point out that there are two members of Black and Brown Just Policy with us tonight that have thrown their hat in for candidacy on the Medical Cannabis Task Force, which to this point only has two people of color um, and uh, nobody that's recognizably or would ever be profiled as of color. So we have uh, Mr. Jonathan Beaver who is running against Michelle Aldrich for the elder seat. Mr. Beaver right here. Historic San Franciscan and was a voting member of the working group that created the Medical Cannabis Task Force. So while we were creating the task force, Mr. Beaver was helping steer us and he had an elder's vote. We also have Mr. Marquise Osby, if you could stand, from Black and Brown Health Policy, who will be running against David Goldman for the patient advocacy. And Marquise made a very eloquent speech about the difference between a patient advocate and a patient educator and um, why some folks really feel like it's a time for a change on the, on the Medical Cannabis Task Force. I also want to remind everybody our next meeting is Friday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Be there, please. Now, I have the beautiful honor of introducing Mr. Derek St. Pierre, who has made sure that many patients in this room got a return of medicine. So for that, we thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, before I came tonight, I was kind of emailed a list of six or seven questions. I've kind of pared them down to three and then ha happy to take questions after that. Um, I'm just going to kind of run through those three because I think they're very uh, timely and, you know, kind of relevant to the particular group we have here. First one is, what are we seeing with our current district attorney? Well, our current district attorney is very vocally supportive of medical marijuana. However, um, in terms of practically speaking, seeing what's going on at the office day to day, I will say in terms of individuals being prosecuted, there are a very low number of individuals that can actually show their medical documentation that are prosecuted for personal possession. That doesn't mean that that you know, stops the initial uh, police encounter where you get arrested if you don't have your paperwork on you, but if you subsequently are able to provide that paperwork, uh, the district attorney's office is in fact dismissing almost all of these cases when it comes down to just personal possession. And what do I mean? Let's say you, you know, get arrested, they cite you for a, a day to appear, show up to court that day, bring your documentation, your ID, DA will dismiss these cases. Um, so I really don't want to focus too much on the personal possession, except what I will say is driving in the car, having marijuana in an actual vehicle, really works to your disadvantage because it gives them any number of excuses to actually go through your entire vehicle. Let's just say you have, you know, your own small personal amount. I would highly recommend, you know, putting it in a trunk or putting it in a sealed container so that, let's say you get pulled over for speeding, illegal right turn, whatever, you don't end up with a situation where they're then, oh, do I smell something or were you smoking just before you started driving? It becomes kind of one of those, you know, uh, never-ending series of questions that once you're starting going down that slippery slope, it's already starting to go the wrong way. So just highly recommend in terms of a vehicle, really, you know, make a little bit of an effort to contain or, you know, put your marijuana someplace so if you do have the unfortunate law enforcement encounter, it doesn't turn into more than a speeding ticket or whatever it started off as. Um, in terms of actual grows, how is our current district attorney? Um, our current district attorney, again, is taking a relatively, you know, it has a very vocally supportive medical marijuana um, approach. It is election season. Everybody's going to, uh, you know, take that high road and say, oh, we're 100% supportive <coughs> of medical cannabis. I can tell you from my experience that unless, a, you know, the actual gardener and garden is documented very well, has enough supporting paperwork, they're still coming in and cutting those things down. 
And um, it's also one of those dynamics that if you don't have everything mounted on the wall and is, you know, current as in not expired, police are going to go through it all, do a plant count, throw away their uh, expired prescriptions, and then, you know, you go from there and you're then having a conversation, oh, you have two valid recommendations and, you know, 150 plants. That just doesn't really add up for, you know, the officer. So, um, in order to minimize your officer experience, stay on top of your paperwork, in order to, if you've already gotten past the officer experience and it is at the district attorney's office, I will say that, you know, the district attorney, if you're able to uh, provide them up-to-date recommendations and really kind of substantiate the actual uh, relationship you have, then there is largely going to be a dismissal. The big catch there is this. Do not, under any circumstances, start having a conversation with the police about how much you receive in remuneration, how much you pay for expenses, how much cash you ever got from anybody, because what they're trying to Wait, do... how much cash you ever got from anybody? What, what they're trying to do is actually uh, start you down the, uh, the slope of, oh yeah, I just got my expenses covered, oh yeah, I got this amount. Next thing you know, they're charging you with sales, and that's the only people they're actively prosecuting in the city, is they can actually show you're making a profit. It doesn't mean that, you know, let's say I, I sold a pound for X amount, and literally it cost me that exact amount in terms of time, expenses, labor. They are factoring that in, so don't even have the money conversation with the police whatsoever. Just not worth your time. Um, so that's you know my truncated version on current policy of the DA. Second one was what to do if your provider is arrested. What questions should you answer regarding your provider? Well, it doesn't really happen so much in this city, but I will say for a fact it happens all the time in other counties. Somebody's garden gets arrested. They have you know 15 uh, you know patient uh, recommendations up on the wall. It's not going to be the same night as the raid, but two, three business days later, somebody's going through all the paperwork and calling and saying, do you know grower John Doe? Well, you know, my ex recommendation is, you know, is that you should talk to the police in the sense of, hi, let me see, what's your name, take the number, take all the information, or if they leave all that on your voicemail, same exact thing, I'd be happy to follow up and get back to you. Do not actually commit to anything during a telephone phone call whatsoever. Do not, you know, affirm anything. Don't deny anything because, you know, literally what they're doing, they're fishing. They're trying to see what you will and you won't say. Take their name, take their number, and then follow up with the individual that is your grower. Figure out what is actually going on. Is there, was there an actual raid on their place? Did the patient recommendation get seized? You know, find out that information before you start blindly answering questions to law enforcement. And so, literally, if I'm the officer calling, say, hi, you know, I found your patient recommendation after we visited so-and-so, are you in fact his patient? Well, I would be very happy to uh, get back to you a little later. Let me get your name, your telephone number, I need to do a little investigation on my own end just to make sure that you're a legitimate authority and I will contact you back. Literally, just very simple, straightforward, just like you were dealing with somebody, you know, you were taking a, a message for your roommate, just get the name, telephone number, it's very straightforward. Then follow up with your grower if you actually know him or her. The other weird dynamic sometimes that is occurring is some dispensaries, and I'm not saying this is appropriate, but some dispensaries literally just give out patient uh, recommendations without the actual patient in the first place knowing about it. Well, if that ends up happening, you know, you should certainly call the collectives that you're associated with and figure out what the hell is going on, who's giving out my paperwork, and, um, you know, just backtrack over it. But you still don't want to answer any of the questions with law enforcement. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help your, your, your grower. It's not really going to do anybody anything in the short term. Um, once that ball has already started rolling, more than likely your grower will retain an attorney and, you know, kind of figure out the game plan and go forward from there. That's, you know, my best advice is, you know, when that call comes on you, take the info just like you're taking a message for anybody else. Don't, you know, answer any questions. It's not your benefit to deny, not really in your benefit to confirm anything. So that's just the truncated version on what a police call because your provider's arrested. Last one, what to do if law enforcement at your door. Well, this isn't necessarily as straightforward of a question as you would think. There's basically two types of law enforcement encounters. 
If they're at your door, they're either there because they have a search warrant and they're going to uh, breach the entry anyway. It says search warrant, we're coming in and we're going to execute it. Option B is they're there because somebody called uh, called the police on you, a neighbor complaint, or just some other dumb dumb reason. Police end up coming by. Well, there's two different ways you should deal with these, but they both start off the same exact way. <coughs> police pounding on your door, and they're saying search warrant. Well, they're gonna knock the door in anyways. If they have a search warrant, you know that door is coming off its hinges. Question becomes, how do you want to deal with this? Well, you buying an extra five, ten minutes while they're pounding on the door, running around trying to destroy all the evidence in this type of case, if you, you know, worst case scenario, you're sitting on a garden, think about it. Not feasibly possible that you could actually get rid of anything of any value. So, I mean, the, the initial reaction of, oh, I'm going to burn my records, toss everything, you know, we're not talking about something you can flush down a toilet and it's gone. We're talking about, you know, substantial infrastructure oftentimes and paperwork and you name it. So my recommendation, frankly, on a law enforcement encounter where they're pounding on the door is you answer the door. Might as well see that piece of paper. Search warrant will have specifically listed the address that they are entitled to search. Ask them to see it. If you answer the door, they have to show you the search warrant before they are allowed in the premises. It doesn't mean that you won't get, you know, handcuffed when you come to the door, but they still have to show you the search warrant physically. My, you know, experience is, is having that door kicked in on you doesn't really do you any value um, in, in the long run, and in fact causes you property damage and out-of-pocket expense. So, in terms of the search search warrant service, they're either going to have the warrant or they aren't. And in that dynamic, you know, if they're determined to kick that door in, it's coming anyways. Second one, they're knocking on the door. Hi, local county sheriff or police department. Uh, we had a complaint. Well, if you don't answer that door, that one, and it's obvious you're home, they're going to keep pounding. They don't magically go away. Police have a noise complaint, some other kind of complaint from a neighbor. You're going to have to deal with it. Part of my two cents on dealing with it is the thing you should have thought about in the first place is your front door should be openable, and anybody from the public, the neighbor, the police, fire should be able to look in and not see jack shit, literally nothing. It should look like your house. So that way if you're dealing with anybody and you open the door and you have somebody in your, at, at your door, your threshold, they don't see anything whatsoever. It is literally, you have to be mindful of, the set of that, that your house has to look like a house if you're doing something else inside when you come to the door. At that point you say, yes officer, what can I do? Pull the door shut behind you and have a conversation. If they're there because of loud music, you're like, sorry, I will turn it down, have a nice day. Then you go back in, turn your music down, and it's all over. If they're there because you're burning something in the fireplace and it smells funny, well, you can try to talk your way out of it depending on how it smells and, you know, what's going on and how cold it is out there. But realistically, you know, the value of you trying to, you know, talk your way out of that is a little funky. So, I mean, in terms of uh, if they're there just about a complaint like that, you do not have to let them in your door. You do not have to do anything. The reason I say it's, there's value in coming to the door is if you sit there and it's obvious you're home, it's obvious something's going on, they're going to make the worst assumption possible and kick that door in. 